really have an intro this week. I just think it's important to note that I'm at the stage of my life where there's not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, but six separate cats running around my house. <laughs> you had asked me two years ago if this is the direction I thought my life was heading. Um, you probably say might yes. Might not be here to record this episode. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, okay. but for the. Go ahead. Oh, all I was going to say is that in class today, somebody was like, You're such a spoiled brat. And I was like, I know, it's on my socks. <laughs> That's a fucked up thing to say to someone. No, they were like referencing my socks. Uh, listeners, I have socks that say spoiled brat on them. You obviously can't see them. I'm realizing that now, but yeah. That's the face well, of life that's, I'm in. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> the intro. I guess we have a podcast to move on to. Da, 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 da. Bah! Welcome and- back, listeners. Woo! <laughs> We're a podcast. Sometimes we plan intros, sometimes we don't. Uh, This week, we're discussing the same stuff we discuss every week. Sex, dating, relationships, Joel and Naomi's exciting lives. Uh, But before we get into this week's topic, Naomi, I have a very special treat. um, And that treat is our drink, which is the limited edition... Mountain Dew Baja Laguna Lemonade. Now, listeners can't see, but on the video, Naomi is making a revolted (laughs) face. Naomi, I was going to bring this up, but I'm glad you've already prompted me. Uh, What does this drink most resemble? It looks like if I went on a really long road trip and dad was driving so he wouldn't stop and I'd have to pee in a bottle. And that's what it looks like. I was thinking like truckers who like throw like the, the Mountain Dew bottles out the window. Uh, but yeah, it, it looks like a a soda bottle filled with urine. It is the most unpalatable concoction imaginable. The only reason I purchased it outside of uh, us having a podcast where we occasionally sample drinks is because friend of the show, RJ, was on briefly this weekend to uh, record his anniversary update. And uh, I purchased it and then completely forgot to do anything with it in the actual episode recording. So here we are enjoying it uh, right now. Let me give uh, a nice little swig. It looks like if you drank a Mountain Dew and then the aftermath of the Mountain Dew Uh is back in the bottle. (laughs) It's got, um, it's not a lemonade funk. It's like a tropical funk. It's got like coconut and and lemon smell, but but it's almost like a suntan lotion. Right. Um, you know how it's like really intense, but also kind of creamy. Oh my God. And I went to Mexico for Christmas. I'll tell the story after you give a reaction. This is all over the place. Um, I don't even, this is, um, there's a cute parrot on the front. That's something. (laughs) Yeah, so it's like they took the base mouthfeel of Mountain Dew, and I guess they added mango lemonade to this. If you'd asked me, gun to my head, if I thought mango was in this, I would not have answered yes. I was thinking, like, uh, clementine or, like, um, some other form of, like, orange. Um, It doesn't taste like lemons. It tastes almost like a window cleaner. Here's the thing. I don't hate it. I'm just never probably going to buy it again. It's um, kind of off-putting. Uh, maybe it'd be good in like like a mixed drink, but boy, you know, they uh, have not been hitting, hitting home runs recently. I'm just surprised that you bought it in the first place. I was thinking that you bought it from like one of those um, discount stores. And you were just oh, like, it'll oh, be in a discount store soon enough. Maybe I'll have an opportunity to purchase it again. Yeah, no, <laughs> like the don't. hot Cheetos yeah. Mountain Dew or other relics from her past. Naomi, speaking of hot Cheetos, this episode is about body image, and I oh, don't really I have, have a tell, good way of I getting to... it started. Okay, then I'll tell my story, my suntan lotion story. I was in Mexico for Christmas, and we were at this restaurant on Christmas Eve, and I ordered like a mahi mahi so it was like this nice you know crispy seared it wasn't crispy it was like a seared fish with mahi mahi with um like a sauce on the side 
and I, I put – usually what I do is I don't like every sauce. I'm not ready to, like, dip it all in or, like, put it on top every single time I have a sauce. So I like to, like, stick a little finger in it, taste it, you know? So – I dip my finger in and I swear to God, if they just put mayo and suntan lotion and mixed it together, that was the sauce that I was eating. And I feel like that's what that drink smells like. Yeah, I used to work for a pokey restaurant and we had all sorts of sauces to put on your fish. And some of them were like tasty and like interesting concoctions with vaguely Asian inspired ingredients. And then there was our spicy mayonnaise, which got rants and raves. And I don't remember the exact recipe, but and I don't think I'm betraying the brotherhood, but it was like two restaurant sized jars of King's mayonnaise uh, mixed with four whole bottles of sriracha. And then I think six cups of granulated sugar. And you just mix that all together until the sugar had dissolved and you put it in little squeeze oh. bottles and people would go ape shit we had people who'd order like a soup cup full of the spicy mayo to take home and we're like oh honey oh 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 honey but yeah the dirty little secret of the restaurant industry is pretty much every sauce you like is just mayonnaise with an additional ingredient added to spice it up yummy so joel to get right into the content of our episode this week speaking of mayonnaise Speaking of mayonnaise, we are talking about um, body image this week. Um, I would like to ask you a question to start this episode off. When was the first time that you remember having body image issues? Did you ever have body image issues? I, I emerged fully formed from the womb, same as I ever was, like Aphrodite from a clam shell. I've always been the same size and weight and beard follicle length. Um, I don't know. Um, I, I think probably like preteen years, I don't know how, but I came under the impression that I needed more muscle. And so I like tried to start lifting weights and exercise more. I was very skinny for a long period of time. And it wasn't until college that I kind of gained some bulk and I was in the gym consistently. Um, but yeah, it really didn't help that I read a lot of superhero comics when I was younger and every single superhero is kind of just like a beer keg with like a head and legs attached. Um, not not the best source for um, good ideas of masculinity. I'm thinking super beer as the next Marvel character. It's just we can market this to keg. Bud Light or yeah. something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get some product placement going. Just be like, it's Coors, man. And Captain America shakes his hand and he's like, welcome. We've got to go kill Thanos. Can you help us with your power of refreshment? Yeah, yeah. This or it could desperate. be in one of those, uh, the, the Spider-Man multiverse movies. He could just show up as a Spider-Man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what about yourself, Naomi? Um, I think like many young women, it was pretty early on. Um, a lot of like things were pushed on me like, oh, you need a boyfriend, even though I was like a toddler, you know, oh, when's she getting her boyfriend? She's so cute. Or like, oh, she's so cute with her, you know, long lashes, blue. I don't know, like super stuff like that. I would say definitely a uh, middle school. Uh, like you mentioned, we read a lot of comics, me secondhand obviously, because you were the one taking them out from the library, but I read them when you were done with them. Yeah, and we again, from us, like, yeah. <laughs> the, the women in them were very big boobed, big butts, very skinny waists, you know, you know, things like that. Definitely when I got to college, though, I didn't necessarily, this was the first time that I realized that I didn't have body image issues to the point where a lot of other women do. Um, I was uh in my dorm room with a, it was like that scene from uh from mean girls where all of them have something negative to say about themselves and they kind of look at you and they're like what's the negative thing you're gonna say about yourself i think that's every scene in mean girls naomi <laughs> no it's like oh i have such big pores my thighs are so fat that. yeah yeah so it was just interesting that like i wasn't like i'm not one to like read ingredient lists from food or like calorie counts and that was like really big and i'm not saying that that's you know like i have to do that now because of my new diet but um 
for hormonal health, but that's not something that I regularly did. And I attribute that a lot to the way that mom raised me as a woman. Um, And we'll get into how parental roles deal with a lot of like body image issues. Yeah. And if I can cut in for a second, um, what inspired me to kind of like want to do this episode recently, and I think we've discussed it before, but um, I've always kind of been aware that like society has certain image, has certain ideas about, you know, size of men, size of women, you know, ideal boob size, ideal, you know, pectoral muscle size, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I saw a tweet recently. I don't know why it kind of set me off, but um, Travis Kelsey is a football yes. player who did he just win the Super Bowl? Yes, I think his team just won the Super Bowl. Yeah. Yes. And he's dating the Taylor Chiefs. Swift. And I saw an article on Twitter, which was like, oh, pork chop alert. Travis Kelsey gets plumped up on the beach, really letting himself go. And there's just a bunch of like negative Nancy's, you know, horrible people on the Internet doing horrible Internet people things. But it was really shocking to me how many people were just like, ah, this guy sucks. He's no longer a paragon of masculinity. And this dude is like. 8% body fat, even in these photos where he's probably put on a little water weight since the end of the season. And so I was looking at that and I was like, you have one of the most like, quote unquote, manly people in the country right now who just won a Super Bowl, which is widely considered to be like one of the most masculine sports, who's in like amazing shape from like a muscle to like body fat perspective and he's still getting shit on god damn society has a bad relationship with body image and you know now that you know we've dug into it a bit more i'm like holy god the people on tiktok are out of control with their ideas about aging and like not getting wrinkles and you know all these amazing hacks to lose weight like water diets and i'm like oh i know this is like always kind of been around but with the internet you can spread information so much faster And so I think, unfortunately, we're in an era where it may be easier to give good information to people, but it's also an era where it's very easy to get bad ideas and bad information by the same token. I think that's interesting. You bring up a good point just because um, I think a very hot topic on social media recently has been the celebrity use of Ozempic, which Mm -hmm. if people don't know, Ozempic is a medication that is used for Um, diabetes and it is now being turned into a weight loss drug and so um, it caused a nationwide shortage I think it was last year or 2022 and a lot of people that actually needed the medication couldn't get a hold of it for diabetes purposes um, because uh, people were using it for weight loss purposes so all of these um, celebrities were coming out um, and were dropping weight very quickly and saying, oh, well, Martha Stewart for, Stewart, for instance, said, I just drink my green juice and I go horseback riding every single day. And um, if you don't know, it's very hard to lose weight when you are as you get older. So unless you were ill, it is very hard as a woman Um, just with your hormones and the way that women's bodies work, it's very hard to lose weight after you go through menopause. So a lot of people are kind of questioning that. Um, You know, there's people like the Kardashians and um, a couple other celebrities, Jessica Simpson and um, just a couple other people that just dropped weight very quickly. And obviously, like there's it's because of this weight loss drug and a lot of people just don't want to say that they were using it. So I don't really have an issue with people using it. I would uh, appreciate if, you know, you, you didn't keep it away from the people that actually needed it, but that that's, that's just me. So, I mean, I, I think going off your point now in turn, it does have like bad implications. And like, I get that a lot of this, you know, isn't necessarily bad on its face, but when it's like, part of this larger cultural movement, I do feel people have an obligation to inform their followers, oh, by the way, I'm using weight loss drugs. Uh, But yeah, you know, I was doing research on this and, you know, there's all sorts of like micro scandals happening across the world with people who get, you know, some kind of 
body image surgery and then don't fess up to it. Um, you know, people who like uh, Korean pop stars who obviously get their chin shaved, like literally the bone like grated down and then you show up and their, 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 their face looks completely different. And like, Oh, I just, um, did some mouth some exercises. Yeah. yeah. Um, or, you know, all the people who are getting buccal fat, buccal fat um, removals from their chins. So they look kind of like, you know, they have like the, the stressed cheekbone look all of a oh, sudden. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, and in the same way, you know, we're now at this point where there is a magical weight loss pill. I mean, it's an injection, but there, there is effectively a magical weight loss pill that, you know, for years, scientists were talking about. And, and now that celebrities have the ability to purchase it, it's very expensive, but not so expensive if, you know, you make a couple million dollars on a movie. Um, they get to be whatever weight they want. And they get to pretend as though, you know, they all got it from working out in the gym and drinking kale smoothies. And they get to attach this kind of moral quality to their weight loss, which is, I think, unfortunate because a lot of their followers are going to believe them when they say, hey, you know, I only did workouts and I only did, you know, 1200 calories a day or something obscene in order to get to this weight. When in reality, it was just, no, it was drugs. It was drugs. And so, yeah, I find it like very deceptive, if not like kind of immoral for your celebrities to say to your followers, hey, I'm a perfect human being who just has, you know, self-control. And the reason you don't look like me is because you suck and you haven't bothered to, you know, put your nose to the grindstone and work hard at this. See, my issue with it um, is just on a scientific level. Um, when the FDA passes um, drugs you know, through to, to go onto the market. Um, there's, it's, it's for that purpose. So specifically for Ozempic, it's for the purpose of diabetes medication. It was not studied. It was not clinically studied to, and it did not go through the trials for weight loss drugs. So a lot of people are having issues now because Ozempic, you have to stay on it for a long period of time. You, you dose back. So yeah. you're on smaller doses as you move through your process. You you uh, lose the certain amount of weight that you want to lose. You're like, okay, I'm, I'm, I feel good about my body now. You have to continue being on Ozempic. So my issue is, is that it causes your appetite to be suppressed, which means that you are not getting all of your nutrients that you need to be in your diet. I'm just assuming here because the vast majority of people, if they're eating one meal a day, they're not going to be eating a green smoothie that has vitamin A, B, C, D, etc. in it. It doesn't have your zinc. It doesn't have your calcium. It doesn't have all these things. So it's it's a multitude of, of things that along with that, there has not been a long-term studies on how Ozempic deals it is in the body. So there's so many things that are just not going to be answered until these people could, could possibly just keel over. So because of long-term use of Ozempic. So there's that on top of everything else. Yeah. I don't know. Like if you're going to be down on that, I feel you have to be down on like, any other fad diet and like pretty much any other like crazy workout scheme that promises to make you look like Chris Hemsworth in 60 days or whatever. Like I, I maybe, maybe it's, you know, morally consistent and you, you do in fact believe all of that. But I think like, if that's the standard by which you're judging, like you're, you're ruling out a huge, huge swath of like the fitness and nutrition industry. I, I think to your first point, like the more important thing is just this idea that this is a diabetes medication diabetes is a disease that kills people you are creating an artificial scarcity a shortage of diabetes life-saving medication by trying to you know lose weight and look presentable in a very limited period of time and that's just grotesque yeah let's move into basic understanding of body image and then how we can kind of help this issue um Basic image uh, definition of body image from the National Eating Disorder Collaboration is body image is, is a combination of the thoughts and feelings that you have about your body. Body image may range between positive and negative experiences, and one person may feel a different uh, feel at different times positive or negative or a combination of both. So um, there's a lot of information about um, people that have um, you know body issues, um, specifically um, talking about what causes it, as well as 
some um, statistics that aren't always accurate just because the vast majority of people that have body image issues don't talk about it in a clinical setting. And unless specifically asked, they aren't going to say, oh, I do have body image issues. So stats do vary very widely. Um, so talking about some community action plans that we can take in order to help body image issues. Um, this comes from mentalhealth.org. To maximize outcomes and reduce the risk of stigma, public health campaigns should focus on messages of healthy eating and exercise for all adults, regardless of weight, and avoid making um, weight the key focus of their messaging. However, creating a less shaming culture can also start a community at a community level with grassroots actions to encourage more inclusive and accepting cultural norms about bodily experience, appearance. So the main thing that I want to focus on here is that a lot of people say um, that, you know, being healthy is being skinny or being healthy is, you know, eating the right things. And to me personally, I think that being healthy is eating what makes your body feel good and exercising on, you know, a regular basis to ensure that your um, heart health as well as your 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 bone health and everything else is working at a standard that it should be working at. So that's my perspective. Uh, Joel could have a totally different perspective. What is your idea of health? Um, I think I have a slightly different take. Um, I listen to a podcast called Maintenance Phase, which digs into a lot of the research surrounding kind of junk health science. And, you know, one of the consistent findings is that, you know, everyone likes to make bold pronouncements about, you know, ideal body size and, you know, ideal diet and ideal workout routine. And there's like so little research that backs it up. Um, and, you know, it, it can vary quite considerably when you do dig into the research for like different racial groups, uh, you know, both sexes, um, the age that, you know, people are, um, you know, even when there is hard hitting data, there are significant differences between the advice you'd give, you know, one person and then the same person, you know, or not the same person, you know, someone in the same room as them, um, just based upon the, the fact that, you know, your genetic predispositions or, you know, your bone structure or your, your gait might be completely different. Um, health to me, frankly, involves more of the mental aspect than the physical. I, I do genuinely think that like a lot of people have this idea of like the perfect body that they've gleaned from porn or, or movies or comic books or whatever. And um, they think that it's magically going to make them happy when they achieve that body weight. But in reality, there are a lot of depressed people with eating disorders, right? Like there are a lot of people who've reached quote unquote, their ideal weight and then continue to go further because they're in the mindset that they always have to be thin and skinny and deny themselves things in order to be happy. And so I think like, it's okay to have like a preference for how you want to look. That's, that's totally fine, but you'll always need to focus more on the mental aspect of it than the physical. You need to be happy with who you are, regardless of what stage you are in your journey. You can't be in this state where you're like, well, my mental health will only improve if I'm in like this ideal condition, if I can fit into these size zero pants, because the odds are you're going to gain weight at some point in your life, right? That's natural. You know, you have a kid, you're probably keeping a weight on. Um, if you, you know, you age, you have like an injury, hip, foot, leg, you're probably going to gain weight. Like the odds are much, much higher that you're going to gain weight than you're not. Um, but yeah, maintenance phase digs into a lot of this research. And one of the things that they found, which I consider to be very fascinating is the research on whether or not being overweight is unhealthy is inconclusive at best. And that doesn't seem intuitive. A lot of people are like, well, you, you weigh more, so you die. Um, and it, it's true in certain settings, but again, when you dig into the data, one of the reasons old people die at Aomi is because of falls. Um, if you fall and you fracture your hip, it's very difficult to recover from that, you know, when you're in your 80s, early 90s. Um, it can lead to all sorts of complications, you know, you might not recover properly, but you also might get an infection, and that's what kills you. Um, if you're overweight- the hospital. If you're overweight and you fall, the likelihood that you break something is much lower. If you're overweight, you have additional padding, and that makes it less likely that, you know, that fall is going to kill you. 
And so while it might be true that being overweight at certain points of your life is unhealthy, it's very untrue that as you get older and older, being overweight is necessarily a problem because at the point where you're 80, right, it doesn't matter if, you know, you have an extra 100 pounds on you. What matters is not falling and dying. So so it's little things like that where I think our culture has created this perception that like the ideal is to look constantly if you're a man like 30 year old shirtless Brad Pitt and Fight Club. And I don't know, what do you think the platonic ideal is for women like Marilyn Monroe doing the teehee thing with like her skirt riding up on the, the storm drain? Or is it Sydney I think Sweeney the most- now? I, I, yeah, I think Sydney Sweeney, Renee Rapp, depending on which side of TikTok you're on. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah, well, you can you can tell both of us are white. If if the listeners haven't picked up on that yet, if you didn't look at our podcast cover, we are indeed both white. <laughs> I've, we're talking about this episode the, this entire time. I just keep going back to to Mark Wahlberg's like fitness routine where he's like, I get up every day at three a.m. and me and my wife pray, and then I do three hours of workouts, and then I start my day, and then I read the Bible, and then I bring my kids to school. And then at 2 p.m. I'm done for the day. I spend the rest of my day with my family. Like that's that's the that's the that's the what I've been thinking about this entire day. You know, I I think prayer would be a lot more appealing. I think like Catholicism would be a lot more appealing if like you prayed and then you like hit your personal PR every single time, right? <laughs> like if that's how it worked, if there's a direct correlation between like your holiness and like your workout regimen, I think a lot more people would be in church every Sunday, not you know worshiping the the iron throne of their local planet fitness i thought that was gonna go somewhere different i thought you were gonna oh, say the, the iron the, throne the porcel- at their local game of thrones experience no i thought you were gonna say the porcelain throne because it's been all sunday <laughs> eating disorder yeah i mean uh, uh I don't know, you know, what direction you necessarily want to take it, but I wanted to share a couple of things about where people might get their bad ideas of what an ideal body is. Oh, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Okay. So a common response to the research linking body dissatisfaction, wow, with exposure to idealized bodies in the media is to suggest that the inclusion of disclaimer or warning labels on advertisements in which models have been edited. However, much of the literature looking at the effect of such labels on responses to fashion advertisements suggests labels may not have any beneficial effects on body dissatisfaction. Several experimental studies have presented young women with advertisements with various disclaimer labels and found no effect on labels on body satisfaction compared to unlabeled photos. In some instances, labels had negative effects, increasing a tendency to compare self to others or resulting in higher levels of body dissatisfaction among women already more likely to compare themselves to others. One qualitative study in this area with British adults suggests that such policies are generally met with skepticism. Some participants felt that even with the label, the intent of the edited photo is still a message that the body type presented is desirable and that reactions to such photos are often automatic or subconscious. Instead, they felt that media should focus on the inclusion of more varied body types and sizes, ages and ethnicities to encourage a more wide ranging and inclusive ideal of beauty. Social media may be, may be one potential route to achieving this diversity of representation. One study of social media accounts that specifically focus on body positivity found that these types of accounts depict a broad range of body types, though the image are still the images are still predominantly of younger women, alongside images of body appreciation and acceptance. So I think that we all know like where body dissatisfaction comes from. The vast majority of the time it comes from media, but there's also um, a portion of it that we can talk about that comes from the home. One study seeking to gain experiment consensus on ways for parents to support healthy body image and eating habits found that parents should seek to model positive behavior around body image, avoid criticizing their own appearance or that of others, and healthy a model healthy eating and activity, praise their children on qualities unrelated to physical appearance, teach children that people have value and deserve respect regardless of their body shape or size, support children to express emotions and communicate their feelings about their bodies, help children develop strategies for coping with comments about their appearance, and avoid placing unrealistic expectations on appearance or conveying that they would be more likable if they changed their weight or shape. 
So, so I just have to add one thing, just one thing. I would like to say that my experience, and I know that everybody's experience is different, but the way that I grew up as a woman in my own home was in my home growing up was my mom did not have a, um, a scale in the bathroom and she made sure that when we were looking at labels, it was because, oh, we're looking at the content of protein and fiber and making sure that we're getting all our nutrients. So that I think helped a lot with my eating habits. Therefore, my body image. Go for it. Um, and, and I think there's this idea that by like, shutting up and never talking about body image you're doing your kid a service and i think that's a bad approach i know this you know kind of touched upon it um but kids internalize stuff even subtle messages even if they aren't like overt and you know parents who refuse to let you trick or treat because you know candy is bad or parents who you know free, refuse birthday cake at a, at a birthday party because you know cake and processed sugars and all of that's bad those 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 things stick in like kids minds and you know i think part of it is the kids associate okay my parent is smart i'm going to follow the decisions that they make but there's also the aspect where like a lot of young kids up until a certain point, uh, want to make their their parents happy. They want their parents to respect them. They want the love and adoration of their parents. And so they think by mimicking the behaviors of their parents, they, you know, will make their parents happy. And so some parents might think, oh, look, I've taught my kid how to, you know, eat in in moderation and, you know, not not consume processed sugars. I've, you know, created such a, a lovely young child. Um, but really, you've probably created a kid who has some level of disordered eating where they like refuse to accept that it's occasionally okay to have a big slice of birthday cake, right? Sometimes you have a bad day and maybe you need to curl up on the couch with Ben and Jerry's. And look, I get it. That's not something that's going to work for everyone. Not everyone uses food as like a coping mechanism, but it's like an incredibly cheap mental health coping skill in a society that has made mental health so like inaccessible to so many people. And so like, when you when you you as a parent are attempting to model good behavior, you need to like talk it through with the kids and be like, hey, the reason I didn't have cake was because I'm not hungry. But go ahead, have some cake uh, or, you know, hey, you know, this this is lovely. But oh, man, um, it's just so rich for me. I can only have a bite or two of cake. But, you know, if you enjoy it, go ahead. Things like that. Um, and, you know, work in healthy substitutes if you can, you know, be like, hey, you know, I know you like gummy bears and I made some from, you know, jam or whatever. Um, you know, I made some dried fruit. I don't know. I'm not a parent. I, I can't think of, you know, activities <laughs> what are you to involve about? my kids in. You have six cats. Oh, I forgot about that. Oh, God. Yeah, the, the <laughs> horror hasn't washed over me yet. Yeah, but but yeah, I, I think the bigger point is like, you need to have these conversations. They may be awkward, they may be uncomfortable, but it's like, you know, the sex talk. You know, if your kid isn't getting it from you, a respected authority, they're probably getting it from somewhere else. And the somewhere else you do not have control over, you do not have say over, you have no idea what's going on as, as the kids are hanging out at recess talking about, I don't know, uh, Blumpkins or whatever they're into these days. It could also be that the kid didn't even get any sex talks. So that's also a part of it. But they got porn, Naomi. <laughs> so I have to like put Judd in here and add a lot of statistics because I'm a statistics girly. Um, Joel, what do you think people are doing about their body image issues? Um, they're seeing all these people on social media they're like oh my god that girl's got a fat ass or she's got a skinny waist or something like that handling it in a in a respectful uh articulate cogent way they definitely aren't bottling any of it up they definitely aren't doing any form of self-harm they definitely aren't depriving themselves of the calories they need to subsist on a daily basis Everyone's a rational actor, Naomi. I took Econ 101. Why would you tell me any differently? So, like I mentioned at the beginning, or not the beginning, but somewhere in this episode, I mentioned that the vast majority of people that have body image issues um, can't, that aren't necessarily put into studies because it's very hard to, you know, get a good percentage of the population that um, kind of, I'm watching Joel drink more of this drink and it's awful. Um, 
it, they don't have a, a good understanding of how uh, percentage wise, um, how m- many people in the population have body image disorders. It's hard to get a good um, representation of that in a study. So what I'm going to give you is, you know, some some statistics that I've put together. Um, the newest body modification surgery that everyone is going after is the BBL which is better known as the Brazilian butt lift. And people travel long distances and go through excruciating pain to participate in this, these procedures. I'm pretty sure it's something like it, you take the, 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 the fat out of your abdomen area and you put it in your ass. I'm pretty sure that's what it is. Yeah, if I can cut in here, Naomi, um, it's only a Brazilian butt lift if it's done in the Brazilian region of South America. Otherwise, it's a sparkling <laughs> butt lift. I hate you so much. <laughs> In 2020, an um, estimated 396,000 people had buttock. It doesn't say buttocks. It says buttock. Singular buttock. Um, augmentation surgery, according to the International Society of Aesthetic Plastic Surgery. And this figure represents a 19.3% increase from 2016, as, have a bul- uh, as having a fuller butt and curvier figure is increasingly popular aesthetic. Um, breast augmentation is the most popular plastic surgery procedure, accounting for 18% of all plastic surgeries performed in the U- U.S. In 2018, there were over 300,000 breast augmentation procedures performed. But then I'm sorry, I can we into- back up a second? Because 2020, something happened that year that shut down the yeah. vast majority of yes. Western civilization. But a lot of people went out of their way to travel outside of the country because they had already set these up. So I looked into this, and actually that was a pretty fair representation of how many people were getting plastic surgery that year. So I thought that was insane. But they don't have any current data, so I can't really compare it. I also would like to say that that was at the beginning of the BBL trend, so that also was a part of it. Okay, one other thing. Yeah. Listener, we have expressed some pointed opinions on police brutality and use of taxpayer funds to create a security state before. Uh, One big problem in America is there are no laws that police departments around the country have to uniformly report crimes or even things like seizures from suspects you know taking their money or use of force against people or even hate crimes and so there's no national database of like how many hate crimes occur in the united states in total each year but we have accurate data for the number of plastic surgery butt implants at the international level being reported out That is mind-boggling to me. We can't tell how many hate crimes happen, but we can tell what percentage of the human race has a fatter ass this year than last year. Oh, it's not human race. This is just national statistics. Sorry to disappoint. No, it said international. It said International Society of Aesthetic Plastic Surgery. Was that just the uh, United States data? Oh, yeah, you're right. Oh, my God. No, no, this says, no, no, this says, uh, no, no, you're right. Sorry, sorry. I was l- thinking about the breast augmentation statistic that I just yeah, read. Yeah, yeah. But yes, you are correct. Yeah. Um, in 2018, Americans spent $16 billion on plastic surgery procedures, a 5% increase from the previous year. But I was thinking about the breast augmentation surgeries, and it says that that's the most popular surgery procedure. But then I was thinking, okay, a lot of people that I know want breast reduction. So I looked into that. And apparently breast reductions are more common than breast lifts, accounting for 43% of all breast surgeries performed in 2018. And they account for a total of 21% of all breast reduction, uh, of all breast surgeries. So Almost all of breast reduction surgeries, 99% are medically necessary, whereas only 14% of liposuction surgeries are medically necessary. So That's interesting because um, I, I know we're going to discuss labioplasty at some point, uh, but I, I looked a little into labioplasty and I found a website from a plastic surgeon that was like, uh, actually, uh, it's really important that people have like labioplasty surgeries because of like uh, discomfort and like getting your genitals stuck in a zipper. That's a, that's a real thing that happens to people. And that's why they get them. It's not because like plastic surgeons have created false icons of which you should worship. 
Um, and so I, I have to wonder, you know, if plastic surgeons are the same people saying, you know, 99% are medically necessary, because I'm sure they might, you know, say the same thing about labioplasties when reporting out that data. But um, that that is fascinating, I would imagine, you know, a lot of people, you know, suffer discomfort from carrying around, you know, 20 pound weights on their chest. Jokes. And, uh, absolute jokes. Absolute cannons. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I bring this up because, um, reading into how many people are satisfied by their plastic surgeries. Um, so a lot of people, uh, choose plastic surgery to improve their self-esteem and confidence accounting for 86% of all cosmetic surgeries performed in 2018. But then I looked into psychosocial well-being and how it differs before and after surgery. So I'm looking at does cosmetic surgery improves uh, psychosocial well-being by David Castle and Roberta Honingman. Um, this study was found on PubMed, so let's get nerdy, people. Overall, the study suggests that most people were pleased with the outcome and felt better about themselves. This was particularly the case for women undergoing reduction mammoplasty, so breast reductions, um, domains of functioning showing improvements including self-worth, self-esteem, distress and shyness and quality of life. However, many of these studies have method methodological limitations including small sample sizes and potentially biased ascertainment. Arguably, patients who agree to participate in such research and obl uh, oblige with pre and post intervention interviews represent a biased group, but none of those studies estimated the extent of such potential biases. So I, I, I'm wondering because you have like apartment complexes that give their people gift cards for positive Google reviews. If the plastic yeah. surgeons are like, you give us a positive review and say it was all for like medically necessary stuff, we'll give you a free nose job. There's also the um, aspect of um, all the people that started having, let's just say, toxic so shock syndrome or infections after, you know, three years down the road, one of their implants busts and, you know, they start getting really sick. That That's becoming a larger and larger trend is a lot of people taking out their breast augmentations or butt implants because they've been getting very sick from them. Yeah, I would imagine um, just just as a note on that. Uh, sorry, I know we, we we keep bouncing back and forth, but if you had a successful plastic surgery, I would imagine your doctor still has a way of getting a hold of you. If you have an unsuccessful plastic surgery and litigation is pending, your attorney has probably told you to cut off all contact. So just by yeah. nature of like the contact system, the percentage of people who are replying and, you know, answering these surveys sent out are probably people who have not suffered like serious adverse effects. Also added on to that, like, I think the amount of time after a surgery to call it a success is six months. And if you get an infection or you get sick three years down the line, they're still going to consider your surgery a success story. So that's also a part of it. Um, there's a particular subgroup of people who appear to respond poorly to cosmetic surgeries. These are people with the psychiatric disorder known as body dysmorphic disorder, or BDD. BDD is characterized by a preoccupation with an objectively absent or minimal dis uh, disformity that causes clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupation, or other areas of functioning. So moving on from that, um, People are satisfied, but again, that's not a good representation of the population. So um, then talking about the prevalence of BDD, um, it, it's common. However, exact prevalence rates are unknown, obviously, like I've been saying. Um, but in mental health settings, so people that, you know, go to therapy on a regular basis or are institutionalized, so on and so forth, 7.4% um, of the population. Um, but then higher prevalence rates were seen in cosmetic slash dermatology settings, up to 20%. So um, moving right along, I just want to kind of move into the social media use and um, like how that has caused dysmorphic symptoms in young people. Um, obviously, we discussed this more at the beginning of the episode, but I kind of want to touch back on this. Frequently, um, the use of uh, image-based but not text-based platforms was significantly and positively associated with body dysmorphic sin uh, symptoms, and this association remains significant in the adjusted model. So appearance-based motivations for social media use was the only motor motivator uniquely associated with body dysmorphic symptoms across the unadjusted and adjusted models. So basically talking about how social media use specifically um, for 
body image issues, not even talking about the issues that it causes in young people um, is very significant. And something that I want to touch on is I was just reading an article this morning talking about um, how Brandy Melville, which is a very big brand that came popularized in the early 2000s, um, has caused so many issues. So um, there's actually a documentary on H. Bio called Brandy Hellville and the Cult of Fast Faction uh, Fashion. Joel, do you know anything about Brandy Melville? Brandy Hellville? Is there Brandy no Hellville. level Netflix will not stoop? <laughs> no, it's HBO, sorry. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, Max Naomi. It's Max. Zoe. You, you you can't use the incredible branding and respect and prominence that HBO had to describe this new company, which emerged from its ashes. Uh, I, I am not. I am completely unfamiliar with Brandy Melville. Um, it, it sounds like a popular actress from like the early 2000s. Like maybe she was on 16 and pregnant or maybe she was like one of those octo moms. I, I don't know. So it's interesting because we have discussed um, the issues with um lululemon and we discussed that pretty recently talking about how every time that the ceo comes out and is like oh i hate women or like i hate plus sized people they'll just cover it up and basically just be like oh but like our leggings are like super great and like they're stretchy and like anyone could fit in them so basically not the same thing but definitely similar so um i'm just gonna give you the highlights of the documentary uh, Brandy Sorry, Melville wait, quick, is a fast... Quick, 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 quick business idea. Can we start a clothing company that only does size zero clothing and it's just misogynistic comments made by the CEOs of other clothing companies like emblazoned on the front? Oh, just you wait, Joel. I think he already took your business idea. Oh, no. <laughs> so Brandy Melville is a fast fashion company that markets to one size fits most uh, clothing to young women. So it's literally just one size for the entire store. Every single I'm shirt sorry. is the same size. What? Sorry, what? Not that's that's not how clothing works. Um, as someone Joel, who is, it gets worse. Okay, keep going. <laughs> um, the Italian clothing brand is run by CEO Stefan Marson, who has been in several racist and anti-Semitic controversies over the past few years. Like all other fast fashion companies, Brandy Melville has contributed significant, significant damage to the environment. U.S. and Europe consume about 36 billion units of clothing per year. 85% uh, percent of that clothing ends up getting discarded. A documentary specifically highlights Brandy Melville's impact on Ghana. So I'm going to kind of move away from the sustainability aspect and kind of um, just tell you, you know, what it is cause issues with in body image because we're, this is a episode about um, body image and not about sustainability but if you would like more information obviously watch the docu series it's called brandy hellville uh brandy melville also contributes to body shaming and sex sexualization of minors so um like um american apparel Former employees have said that minors working in store receive frequent demands to send pictures of their feet, chest, and body, uh, full body to senior leadership. Marston, the CEO, would reportedly decide whose body type didn't match the brand's image and firing young women that he found unattractive. Brandy Melville uh, faced uh, several accusations of anti-Semitism and racism. The company's senior leadership uh, group chat was exposed for featuring several texts that praised Nazism, degrade, uh, de uh, degraded black people, and made fun of plus-size women. Marston also allegedly only hired minorities to work away from public view, making statements that he did not want black or Indo-Pacific people to represent his brand. Brandy Melville also became a source of environmental destruction, has become a source of environmental destruction, racism, anti-Semitism, uh, body shaming, and the sexualization of minors, and so much more. One size fits all. Hmm. Um, you know, it's interesting you bring up the Nazism because uh, we, we, we've discussed fascism before on our podcast, specifically in the yes. context of why women deserve less. But you can apply the ideas found in fascist thought to a lot of things that help explain people's worldviews. Um, and one good example is uh, Nazis uh, were, were big fans of physical fitness 
and you know encourage their youth and, and their 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 men and their their women to work out and you know fit this platonic ideal of an Aryan. Because for fascists, um, your body is not your body. Your body is a tool of the state. Your body is a tool that the state uses to enforce its will upon other people. So you can't have, you know, flabby men walking around. You need strong, muscular men who can fight in your wars. And you can't have, you know, weak women out there. You need strong, sturdy women who can have as many babies as are necessary to, you know, feed the war machine. Um, Not saying that's where Brandy Melville's racist chats are coming from. I would say it does fit into a similar ideology where it's like women's bodies are not their own. Women's bodies are for the consumption of us, pervert men, who are going to, you know, judge you on how sexually appealing we find you. And if we don't find you sexually appealing enough, too bad, you're out. You're off the island. You're off the one-size-fits-all island. Wow. It always always comes back. Just, oh my god, the whole idea of one size fits most is just mind boggling to me because there's just such an incredibly wide range of like human body shape and sizes and proportions. Um, it, it's it's truly baffling. And I checked, and the average weight of a woman is, is 170 pounds in America. I'm gonna go out on a limb and say the majority of their clothing was not designed for that body size. Um, but but then there's also the fact that like there there are women who who are top heavy there are women who are bottom heavy there are women with tiny butts women with big butts women with extra large torsos like vertically women with extra large legs um you know women with different sized arms um and and I want to throw this in I was going to bring it up at the end of the episode but we'll throw a link into the description too um if you are someone who like struggles with an idea of you know what you should look like as a specific aged woman specifically raced woman or or man um a a a a specific uh weight uh there's this great website called my body gallery where people anonymous people upload photos of their bodies and they'll give you their measurements and their weight and it'll show you that you know a woman who's 170 pounds and five six can look short and squat they can look tall and skinny. They can look sturdy. They can look muscular. There's there's a wide range of you know ways that weight can show up on people's bodies, even if your BMI and your height and weight are exactly the same. So, um, God, what a what a gross business model from the get. Because like this, just this whole branding idea that like one size fits most seems like it's designed to give people an eating disorder. Right. I don't know how you get around that. I think that's kind of the whole point. And I definitely would say that it's targeted more towards teens. Um, so you're really just getting them right as they're beginning their life and really just did they sell did they sell diet plans? Life. That's so clever. They should sell like diet plans at checkout too. Oh, that'd be so smart. Yeah. Uh-huh. uh-huh. Great business model. Well, Joel, that's all I have. What do you have on body image? Hit me with it. Um, I don't know. I, I, we don't need to dig too deep. I think you've covered a lot of territory. You've kind of given the background and like the effects and shit sucks. Boy, howdy. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about like where this stuff comes from. So people have a better idea of like where to be critical in their day to day. Um, and I think the best place to start is probably porn. <laughs> Um, because most people have consumed porn. Most youth have consumed porn. Unfortunately, they don't get sex ed either from their parents or in schools. And so their idea of what sex is and what sexy people look like comes almost entirely from looking at it on the internet. Uh, and this creates problems. Uh, there's a popular science article published in 2013. I would have found something more recent, but it doesn't look like this has been repeated. Uh, the article was titled What the Average American Porn Star Looks Like by Francie Deep, published February 20th of 2013. It says that your average American porn star is likely to be a brown-haired, California-born woman named Nikki Lee. Uh, that was the conclusion from writer and researcher John Millward's study of 10,000 actors' entries in the Internet Adult Film Database. So there is kind of like an imdb for porn stars i guess and i guess because it's porn they upload like the height and weight of all these porn stars too so you can like extract like really solid information about like all of these people 
And so he went through and he was like, okay, well, what, what, what do these measurements look like compared to the majority of the population? Um, interestingly, the racial breakdown of people in porn closely matches that of people all over the United States. Now, I would possibly disagree with this one because it's my understanding that while there might be a similar number of people working in the industry, I don't think certain racial groups get the same number of bookings as other racial groups. And so like, just because you happen to be an actor in the industry doesn't mean like you're a representative sample. Uh, but uh, American porn actors have the same average height as the general American population, but they weigh much less. Male actors weigh 14% less than the average American man. Uh, so let's say uh, if you weigh 200 pounds, just off the top of my head, 10% would be 20 pounds, 15% would be 30 pounds. So yeah, they're weighing about 170 pounds. Um, obviously, I think most American men are like 220 I don't know off the top of my head, but like, yeah, it's, it's a pretty significant difference. And obviously their body fat percentage is going to be much lower than a comparable person. Uh, Naomi, actresses weigh a whopping 29% less than the average American woman. Whoa. So let's do that. Let's do that again. Uh, let's say 170 pounds for the average American woman. 17% would be, or 10% would be 17. 17 times three. I'm going to embarrass myself live on air. 51 pounds, I believe. So the average American porn star is 120 pounds approximately compared to the 170 that the average woman weighs. Yeah, that's going to give like you some to- skewed perspectives. I would like to cut in as an individual that worked with people that um, used intravenous drugs. Um, The vast majority of people that are on some sort of drugs weigh a lot less than the normal population. And um, if I know anything about porn is that it's very taxing on your mental health. And the vast majority of people that come out of porn um, afterwards say that the vast majority of the time they were high while they were shooting or um, something else was going on. Um, It causes a lot of mental health issues, which leads into drug use. So um, if I were to say anything, I were to say that the vast, I would, I would guess that the, um, the, the people that are underweight are probably underweight because of drug use. Yeah, and and like I think we need to be clear here. When we talk about body image issues, we're not using that as a code word for being overweight because there are plenty of people who are quote unquote underweight just naturally, right? There's a decent chunk of people who, you know, they eat as much as they want. They they don't necessarily have like a clear diet and they, you know, are 5 foot eight will say and weigh 100 pounds and they just happen to have a body type. They happen to have genetics that builds them in that way and often you know a lot of these people become models and whatnot they'll fit into the industry but um yeah people shouldn't look at that and be like as you know a sturdy midwesterner uh that's you know an ideal i should aspire to um just because like it's probably not going to be as realistic for you some people have it some people don't don't look to these people as like your platonic ideal but also don't feel bad if you don't fit you know a specific end of the spectrum You know, there are plenty of overweight people who would like to be underweight. There's plenty of underweight people who want to gain weight and be a little curvier and thicker. So, like, it goes both ways. Yeah, eating disorders impact people in a variety of ways. A couple other fun facts. The most common stated actress bra size is 34B, while American women now average something in the D cup range. Um, the greatest number of porn actresses have brown hair followed by blonde then black then red, uh, blondes, however, are overrepresented, uh, 32.7% of actresses in porn have blonde hair. And then the reason they said at the start that the average person was California born is because a third of all porn actresses said they were born in California. Um, so if you were to look at like a representative sample of the United States, California is not where 33% of our nation comes from. And obviously there are large swaths of ethnic and regional differences all around America that are not represented. Um, yeah. So, uh, I, I thought that was interesting and I think that definitely informs a lot of people's perspectives on what a healthy body size is. So be very critical in the types of, you know, sexual content you're consuming, but also be critical of the types of TV and television. Did I say TV and television? TV and movie media that you are consuming because you're going to see a lot of that on screen as well. Uh, There's an article in Vox from 2021 by Alex Abad Santos-Salex. The open secret to looking like a superhero, how performance-enhancing drugs help create the new male body standard. 
Um, so I won't go too much in detail about this, but basically the idea is that um, performance enhancing drugs or PEDs are very, very popular in uh, the movie industry. Uh, they are not openly discussed. Uh, it's one of those things where actors, again, want to create them this image of themselves as like a perfect moral being. And because they've starved themselves, because they've you know stuck to a routine, they deserve this incredible body that for some reason, people who worked out consistently, you know, 40 years ago didn't look like, you know, Sylvester Stallone in the first Rocky uh, did not look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, he definitely worked out to a certain extent, but like, yeah, you look at some of the, the, the Zeus like bodies of people these days and they, you know, are really nothing you can achieve without steroid use and consistent steroid use at that. Uh, for people who are like, the rock is all natural. Uh, the rock has owned up to using steroids in the past. He most likely is still using steroids to a certain extent, but I guess the bigger point is you really can't start building a body that big without like significant steroid use. So he's had an artificial leg up regardless. Um, so yeah, that, that's all interesting. Um, unfortunately there's not a lot of solid data on this. It's just kind of like people who research this and professional, like, coaches looking at a movie star and being like you cannot put on 60 pounds of muscle in three months like they did for this role like you cannot do it unless you are taking performance enhancing drugs um, or even like human growth hormone um that th there are concerns about it um because you know uh, rapid muscle growth has like actual health impacts and this goes to kind of our society skewing what's considered healthy like if you put you know kind of an overweight schlubby guy next to like a really buff roided out guy a lot of people would say that the super buff roided out guy was like the healthier option but then you dig into it and you're like oh actually there are some significant health risks that come with putting on a huge amount of muscle really quickly uh there was an article talking about positive traits um i don't have the source i will try to put that in the post Oh, oh, this was a LinkedIn post by uh, a doctor who discussing the impacts of anabolic uh, steroid use in bodybuilders. Uh, it's from Sunfox Technologies, October 18, 2023. Um, so it was looking into use of heart, uh, not use of, uh, the prevalence of heart attacks in bodybuilders. Uh, it found that anabolic steroids could raise blood pressure after cholesterol levels, promote the formation of blood clots, and negatively impact the heart structure and function. These adverse effects can increase the risk of damage to the heart structure and function, and they can increase the risk of heart attacks strokes and other cardiac issues uh that's compounded by the fact that uh, bodybuilders go through extreme training so they go through rigorous training regimens involving heavy weightlifting high volume workouts and intense cardiovascular exercises now exercise is typically beneficial for heart health but excessive and prolonged strain on the cardiovascular system can potentially lead to problems. The body's response to intense weightlifting or prolonged periods of high-intensity exercise can result in elevated blood pressure, increased cardiac output, and changes in heart structure, which can lead to cardiac abnormalities and increased risk of heart-related complications. Now, keep in mind, that's also in conjunction with improper nutrition and dehydration. So when you do things like severe caloric restriction or dehydration, that leads to imbalances in electrolytes and blood volume. Uh, when you dehydrate it, your blood becomes thicker, which moves through your veins at a slower rate, um, and that can tear things, that can inflame things, cause all sorts of problems. So again, you know, we have this cultural idea that when you're roided up, when you, you know, look like Arnold Schwarzenegger, you're a healthy individual. No, there are a decent number of bodybuilders and football players and other people who we think of as like super jacked and in shape who die kind of young. And I'm not saying like there aren't complicating factors. Like we can look at football players and say, Oh, that guy got like concussed multiple times. And that probably led to an early death. Um, but it kind of goes to show you cannot literally put up two photos and say one person is healthier than the other. It just doesn't work like that. Lifestyle plays a huge role. Genetic factors play a role. Um, I mean, I would, you know, reiterate the fact that mental health plays a role too. you know, that the happier fat person who has a great community around them is probably going to do better health wise outcome wise than the, you know, bodybuilder who spends all their time working out in the gym and, you know, doesn't have anyone to go home to at night. There are happy bodybuilders. Don't get me wrong. But, you know, trying to present these as in a vacuum and saying one is objectively better than the other is not something I think this podcast is endorsing. Um, it. Yeah, there's there's all sorts of mitigating circumstances and you as an individual trying to process all this information should not come to the conclusion that, you know, there is an objectively good way of living your life. Um, 
there there are better ways there are worse ways but you know if someone's trying to tell you they figure it out they've cracked the code for optimum physical and mental health they probably got a bridge to sell you somewhere <laughs> it's in baltimore and it's under the bay oh why would you say that people lost their lives that is true let me know when we can joke about the baltimore tragedy give it two more weeks okay we'll do okay well, um, I would like to say uh, I really appreciated recording this episode. We hope you enjoyed it. Um, we hope you have a great week. Um, for those of you that don't know, we have a Patreon. We'd love for you to um, subscribe to it. Give us some money. Uh, we're giving our money to abortion funds right now, transgender moving funds. Uh, Where are we giving our money anti -genocide to? Anti-genocide funds. funds. Anti-genocide funds this month. That covers um, a lot of area, a lot of ground. Yeah, yeah. So um, we would, that's where all of the money is going. We don't pocket any of it. But we also understand that you, like, the economy sucks. So um, if you want to help us but can't monetarily help us, it would be great if you could um, give us a like, a um, nice comment on our YouTube or our, you know, plethora of streaming platforms. And we hope you have a great week. Wear a condom. Be nice to your parents. They're cool sometimes. And uh, we love you. Kiss a baby. With the permission of the adult who's in charge of that baby. <laughs> Bye for now, y'all.